There are times when the simplest answer is the best. Whether or not we'll accept it, I, that's, that's another thing entirely. But sometimes it's just the simple answer. I was asked to come to a, a large uh, Christian university. They were doing a, a series of lessons. These are sometimes called lectureships or um, conferences or the like. And they'd asked me to come do the first one, and that was always ready to answer. And I think that they'd chosen me because I like doing question and answer things, and I like going places where I can get the questions and answer, but also because science background, um, I'm known for talking about why I believe. But they'd chosen this passage, and I, it just, I decided to do something different with it. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. But in your hearts, reveal Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give them the reason for the hope you have. I stood up and read that passage, and I said, the answer for the hope I have is Jesus. And that's the only answer we have. Because they'd asked me to come a very long way, I found other ways to say that exact same thing for the next 25 minutes. And there were those afterwards that were very unhappy with me because they'd wanted something different. But our answer is Jesus. When the community of God was being formed early on in the book of Acts, please remember God already had a community. He had the community of his chosen people, the Jews. And they were faithful. They were, they, they were there for him. And so many believed in Jesus, especially as you look at the opening chapters of Acts. And you've got 3,000 here and 5,000 here. And yes, it was not an unadulterated joy. There were times of prison and such. But that first initial burst, they were there. One of the most quoted scriptures when I was a boy in our particular community of faith was Acts 2.38. We knew that one. You repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the Holy Spirit. We loved that verse. We believed that verse. And so we should. Uh, we should. It's a true verse. And yet, there's that bit after there's a little bit after. They had devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, or in most uh, versions of the Bible, to the apostles' doctrine. Now, very few of us ever use the word doctrine outside of church unless you're into military things or foreign policy, because in those, they'll talk about these doctrines or that doctrines. But doctrine just means teaching, so it's all right to say the apostles' teaching. What was that teaching? There'd been one sermon. That was it. This is Acts 2, the beginning. There was one sermon, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. So what was that teaching? Well, in the church in which I was raised, they actually worked this into Bible classes and sermons. What was that teaching? It is everything the Bible has to say about truth. And I immediately had questions, but I knew better than to ask them in the church where I was. But I was going, how, how hard? That was a big download in one day. And I can remember once finding a safe minister, I thought, and I was just a boy. And I said, so what was it? And he goes, everything. And he pointed me to Second John, which says, don't even let somebody in your house if they do not hold to the doctrine of Christ. And I said, what is the doctrine of Christ? And he said, everything. And I actually said, the Bible tells us how big the bed was for Og, king of Bashan. Is that? And he goes, yes. I went, okay. And I tried to believe it. I tried so hard to believe it. But it doesn't work historically because it was day one. It was the first sermon What's going on here? I was given the list. It's music, hair, 60s, hair was in a lot of sermons. 
clothes, food and drink, uh, games, diversions, church organizations, so much, much more. And in fact, if people, there are, I heard so many sermons, and most churches do this, that if you want looking for the true church, look for, and there are the, these external things about what they do, what they don't do, how they worship, and how they're organized. And yet in Acts chapter 2, we're looking at a people who are just beginning to be a community of God in a new way. Please remember, in Acts chapter 2, the sermon was to Jews. Because Gentiles are not gathering at Passover. God is not dumping the Jews and grabbing the Gentiles as his new people. The first sermon, the first community of God rehab 2.0, were Jewish people. And they were just beginning to understand the reality of Jesus Christ. Everything, everything changes when Christ appears. Christ happened. And because of that, every hinge point of history has now turned. It's different now. And we've been adopted into his family by faith. But no books about him had been written yet. Paul wasn't even a Christian in Acts chapter 2. So, can we go to Paul's books and say those are part of the apostles' doctrine? I think you can in some way, but don't overplay that hand. I was taught that the apostles taught them everything about everything, but there's no evidence for this. I was told that they were kind of hammered into conformity by these teachings. But history shows us they were not conformed. I am not sure that somebody from Philippi would have enjoyed going to church at Corinth. I don't think they would find much in common with Corinth. I would hope that our church doesn't find much in common with Corinth, actually. If you want to read 1 Corinthians, the first few chapters, and feel really judgy, it's a great thing to read. Um, too many assumptions are made when we talk about this apostle's doctrine. When you try to shoehorn everything you believe about anything into a box and label it apostle's doctrine, you end up with a huge long list of do's and don'ts. Did you grow up with a long list of do's and don'ts? I did. It, and it, you didn't have to be in my particular um, faith community for that. I think that's endemic for almost all faith communities. Long list of do's and don'ts. Even among the most strict, I can remember spending some time in northern Indiana where there are a lot of Amish people there, and I, I kept seeing differences among them, and so I would ask the local people, and they'd say, well, yeah, their bishop lets them use a lawnmower. Their bishop lets them do this. That bishop does not. And we're in a little town like Shipshawana, which has, if you're from Shipshawana and watching this, first of all, I'll be amazed. What are there, 300 people? If you're there... And half of them are Amish, so probably not watching. You know what I'm talking about. Every one of these had a long list of do's and don'ts. So it's not just my community. All of these communities. But you know, the Bible has something to say about list of do's and don'ts. It really does. And it's very firm about it. In Colossians 2, verse 20. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world. Why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations, indeed, have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. That's what it says. I must tell you, every time I read this, I think of the time where, this may surprise you, especially as we've just entered the Lenten season, that there are Protestant denominations which believe that you should not celebrate Easter at all, that it is a pagan holiday, it is not, or that it is a Catholic holiday, it is not. It is a Christian 
one that has been borrowed from the Jews. It's been celebrated for 3,500 years. So I know and if you want to send me the emails with your really bad history, you go right ahead. Um, I, I've, I've read bad history before. But they are very opposed. And I read one from a church that liked to publish their findings and send it out to everybody about attacking those that would celebrate Easter. And it actually said in it, uh, as the Bible says, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. The absolute opposite of what it's saying. One of the two times in my life, I won't talk about the other one because it's not germane here, where I actually threw what I was reading and went, oh, no, done. If this burst into flames, I don't want to be hurt. Of course, I threw it over there, so best of luck to you, I guess. You know, it, it's just one of, I just, I was appalled. The Bible says this does not work, and yet every new reader of Scripture, every new denomination comes along and discovers, put air quotes around discovers, that its list of do's and don'ts is the apostles' doctrine. I can remember once sitting in a group of my people with a group of another denomination, and we were talking about what we might be able to have in common so that we could start talking together. And we had talked about our worship and such, and uh, then it was their turn. And one of them said, what is your doctrine of holiness? And we all went quiet. It's kind of, we got a doctrine of holiness? <laughs> I, we, we were good people, and I think, I think those people are holy people. Right? We're not making fun of them. They're going to they're go to heaven, too. It is, but they, none of us had really thought about that. You see, our lists were different. We had different lists. That's what happens. How do you deal with this? And more important, how do we discover what the apostles' doctrine really was? Oh, we can do that. By forensic examination, we can backwards engineer our way into this. And it's not that hard. We do it all the time in science. Our belief in dark matter and dark energy is entirely based upon the fact that while we can't see them, we see their effects on the things we do see. It's why we believe that there are quanta out there, little bits of information. There are the string theory is out there where everything is based upon a set of vibrating little loops that loop together. I won't go more into that because I've been told not to uh, by people I, I'm married to. I won't really discuss, say, just narrow it down. Um, but... We know these things that we cannot see because of their effects upon the things that we can see. And when we act like these things are true, we can actually predict things and they happen in science. And so we know the underlying is true. You can backwards engineer these things. So what was the effect of living under the apostles' teaching? I mean, the, the One phrase is not divorced from the other here. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. So take a look. Chapter 2 of Acts. It was read to you today. To the breaking of bread into prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. Now we know that they weren't all agreeing about everything all the time. Frankly, God likes variety. He, he showed you that in his creation. He makes variety of everything, an explosion of variety. And where two people always agree about everything, one of them is unnecessary. We have the other one. I have never learned anything from somebody that I agreed with them about everything. We need that iron sharpening iron. We need that rubbing up against each other, every now and then throwing sparks to learn. So that's... It doesn't mean mentally all on the same page of do's and don'ts. They had everything in common. Not about, again, doctrine. If you try to make this doctrine, it doesn't fit with the following verses. What were they together about? Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They 
brought their things together. They brought their lives together. This would, by the way, be a summary, a, a Cliff's Notes. Do they even do those anymore? Of, of a much longer day. You see, we read Acts chapter 2, and because we are Westerners that have been um, really taught by, by thousands of years, I'm sorry, hundreds of years of church history, we immediately think Peter steps up and the other apostles are maybe sitting on those chairs behind him that some churches have on the stage or dais and um, you know, nodding as Peter preaches and, and everybody's over there listening and, they not, and then when he's done, there's, a, there's this thing about baptism. They didn't have microphones. Things were busy. There were animals around. Sacrifices going on. All the apostles we're talking all the time, moving from group to group, answering questions, bringing up things. Peter is the one who gets summarized here, but it would have been summarized. And what a summary it would have been. People seeing the fulfillment of prophecy. But they had to be told about it or they would have missed it. You see, there's the thing. We rarely see about anything that's happening because we're living in the past and the future. We, we really miss the now. I think a lot of people have died having never lived one moment in the present. It used to be that governments tried to distract the people by sending them to the Colosseum and handing them food, and it was called bread and the games. They don't have to do that now because we carry our Colosseums in our pockets. Our phones distract us from reality, from truth. We have done it to ourselves. Well, if you were right there, what happened? The Spirit came, as foretold. We've talked about that. Young and old, men and women, this is mentioned more than once in Peter's sermon, that women are also fully engaged partners and participants in this kingdom. Now doing all this, and God's doing wonders on the earth. God is upsetting the way the world does things. I, I struggle with trying to figure out how to explain that. My, my wife and I used to talk about things I would end up having to do when I'd walk into a room, uh, and I would just end up saying, I kicked over the trash cans. You know, in other words, I, I had to upset some things. When God came, he didn't kick over trash cans. He brought order. We were living in trash, and he brings order to it. But not order in the Western sense of everybody marching in time. No. He's upending the entire universe, and everybody's invited to join in. And what was their answer? Jesus. That was the message in Acts 2. Jesus. He's the answer. You killed him, and he's still the answer. That's the cool thing. You rejected him, you killed him, God raised him, and he's still the answer. It's not like, and you are in so much trouble, mister. It's still the answer. He proved himself by his testimony, by miracles, by wisdom, and by the testimony of a holy life, what St. Patrick used to call the true sign of the cross, a holy life. Even after being rejected and killed, raised from the dead, conquered death, and still offers us eternal life. Psalm 1611, look at that later. He has made known to us the paths of life, and we will find joy in his presence. Work that into your prayers. Psalm 1611. We already know the Holy Spirit arrived with power. We've talked about that on the day of Pentecost. And we've seen the apostles tell all in attendance to be baptized for the remission of their sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2 and verse 40, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation we see that the apostles knew what we have been talking about for the last month and a half. This world is not prepared for what we're about to do and what has really happened and the new reality that comes here. They're not ready for this. This world isn't going to warmly embrace you. Peter could stand up and really believe, and it and worked out to be true, that he was going to receive a warm welcome from many of that crowd because they had been prepared for 1,500 years. 
But from that day forward, the world was not going to be prepared. It's an untoward generation, corrupt generation. Is our generation any better? And by the way, if, if you chimed in right there, no, we're a lot worse. No, no, read history. Every generation thinks it's the best and the worst. No, it is just like theirs. We have work to do. How did they survive? Verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the reality of Jesus. They ate with each other. They worked with each other. They had everything in common, and that absolutely specifically means what they possessed. I preached that once many years ago when I was asked to preach, uh, fill in a sermon in a southern church, not in Tennessee. Tennessee is perfect in all of its ways, <laughs> especially Middle Tennessee, where I live. But anyway, um, and I wouldn't want to paint the, the state as bad because it's not a bad state at all. But after the sermon, a couple of the men pulled me aside and they said, we, had, uh, we were very uncomfortable with what you talked about. And I'm just thinking, because back then, I was a fully paid up, licensed, and you know, uniformed member of my community of faith. They said, that sounds a little communism. <laughs> and of course, I was appalled because I, I didn't know what communism was, but I knew I was against it. I'm still against it. Still against all the isms, frankly. We, are, we hold all things together, not by force of government, but because of brotherhood. Because we love each other. What's, what we have, we share. Even as Josh set this up perfectly, it's a toy. And I love dogs. I love them too much to have one, because I'm always traveling. Wouldn't be kind to a dog. But dogs, I think, are a gift to us. And they like, they love to show that, you know, love back to you. Uh, it's, it's amazing what we've done with wolves. We've made them purse dogs, and it's really sad. But they're, they're still a gift to us. They gave to each other. Every day, they joined with each other. They devoted themselves to being in each other's lives. Jesus came to save all of us. I've heard this said. And this is one of those things which is very truthful, but it leads to an untruth. Um, that if you were the only person who ever lived, Jesus would die for you. I think that argument can be made, yes. But what does that lead to? It leads to the concept of us as individuals. God speaks to us as groups. He pulls us together. Our group may look different than other groups, but we're still a group. He doesn't want us to live in isolation. He wants us to pull our talents, abilities, our possessions to make all this work. Sharing life is the first thing mentioned in the list of effects that it has to, for those living in the apostles' doctrine. They shared life. They shared their food. They shared their time. They shared their stuff. Now, that's one of the reasons why for, um, we're always asking you, join us. Do a video. Do a greeting. Do, do a communion for us. Do giving. Do a little sermonette. You know, do whatever you can do. Do a song. We've had people uh, do songs for us. Do those. And you might be thinking, I'm not professional. I'm, we're not either. Every Sunday, I can tell you right now, the team... Uh, the tech team afterwards goes, oh, we, we should have pushed that button. <laughs> we should we're, we're, every Sunday we're learning. One of the reasons we want you to do this is for you. You need to know you're a part of something and you need to share your talents, share your life. You might not feel talented, but just say, all right, my name is, this is where I live, and this is where I watch our safe harbor, and I like this very much, and you know, th then we get to know you. You've shared who you are with us. That's why we do things like the $17 blessing, to share your stories. 99.9% .9 of people won't do it. They won't share the stories. I think m 
I think a good percentage of you are out there doing good. But they won't share the stories, and I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because Jesus used that phrase, don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. That's an expression. I don't know that it's possible. You know, we did have one guy uh, when I was a little boy that always, he, he just reached, he even told people, he just reached in his left pocket and just gave whatever was in there, didn't even have, you know, my dad on the way home said, if he'd had a 20-pound note in that pocket, I bet the right hand would have figured that out. But my dad, well, I think he was probably correct on that one, frankly. Sharing meals, sharing goods. Can we be really blunt here? They didn't expect the world to meet their needs. They didn't expect the governments to approve of them and to supply their needs. They took care of each other. And for many reasons, and in many ways, we have all of these social safety nets because the church failed. The church didn't. And the church handed it off. Once handed off, it doesn't come back. But does that mean we don't have to do it anymore? I've heard people say, well, I pay taxes. Well, good, you're supposed to. But that does not absolve you from the apostles' teaching. Because of Jesus, we act really strange to the world. This was quite a draw to the outsiders. We know this because the Romans sent in spies from time to time, and they'd come back saying they share. They give. Not one, this is from more than one of the spies, said not one of them is in want or need of anything because they share. Very few of us are likely to become Amish. We admire the way they do their work. I certainly do. And the way they take care of each other. You'll never see an Amish farm go bankrupt. They will swarm in. They will take care of each other. But what if Christians decided to do the same, but rather, in, rather than in isolation? We did so in our open communities, like St. Patrick did, in that Celtic evangelism we talked about before. That way people could see the, the difference between us and the world because they saw Jesus in us, and we were not afraid anymore. We're not afraid of who's going to supply our needs. We're not living in scarcity anymore. Have you ever eaten something you weren't hungry for, but it happened to be there, and you didn't want to pass it by? We do that. We'll stop to get petrol. It's petrol. It's not gas. Gas is... It's a liquid. (laughs) So you stop and you get petrol, and people say, do you want a snack? And immediately, people start factoring in. There are available snacks. There may never be snacks again. We're not hungry, but now we are. Now, if you're driving across Utah, I get it. There is literally a sign that says, no services the next 160-something miles. And they mean it. (laughs) But otherwise, we live in this scarcity mindset. Eating together means something, as does the sharing of food. People in Corinth came in for kicking when they forgot that. Do you remember? They forgot to share their food. And Paul nailed them for it. So here... At the sound stage, we eat lunch together after. We've eaten at that restaurant so much, all of us know the menu. We've eaten everything there many times. But it's not about the food. And then some gather during the week, every Tuesday night at this place or the like, and I think that's going to catch on and grow even bigger. I don't know what you're doing, but maybe you could start something like that. Not a hint of scarcity, which is weird because... We live in so much plenty that many of our stuff, much of our stuff is wasted, rotted, rusted, or forgotten. You ever forgotten you had something? Yeah. I've bought the same book, thinking, I need to read this. And before I read it, bought it again. That makes you feel like you're you're ready for the home. (laughs) But do you believe in the generosity of God or not? Do you believe in the provision of God or not. They did, and they modeled it. So we wrap this up. What would happen? What would it be like if all the commercials about our money, our health, our medication, our gold, our retirement savings, and Medicare didn't frighten us at all? What would it be like if we knew we could rely upon each other and knew they could rely upon us? The other worldly transformation you would see 
the answer to our fears of the future or the present or our regrets of the past is Jesus. That's the apostles' doctrine. And that is ours. Ours. 